Good afternoon. This is Bob Luddy. Uh, welcome to our book review, The Dethronement of Truth, Dietrich von Hildebrand. Uh, he lived between 89, 1889 and 1977 and was an amazing philosopher, which we'll tell you a little about as we go along here. I want to uh, welcome our guest, John Henry Crosby. Uh, John Henry is the founder and president of the Hildebrand Project which includes the translation because most of this, these works were all done in German. So it's both the translation, publication, and promotion of his works. So welcome, John Henry. Bob, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, John Henry, can you just give us a, a brief on what did he really mean by the dethronement of truth? Well, he had in mind all the different... Um, uh, ideologies and isms that we'll talk about in our presentation today that either involve a conscious uh, denial of truth, but more often an indifference to truth, um, or setting it aside for for other uh, for other criteria. You know whether something works or whether it is in the spirit of the times. And for von Hildebrand, truth was the central the capacity for truth was one of those things that not only defines us as persons, but also really assures our dignity because it's the pursuit of truth and living by truth and uh, working out our differences by appealing to truth that ultimately uh, are the condition for our flourishing and for our, our society. Very good. Thank you, John Henry. Uh, so Hildebrand was a 20th century German philosopher. Uh, he took up the great questions as all philosophers do and had some uh, groundbreaking ideas and philosophy. Uh, he loved this quote, and I love it too, from Aristotle. Let us make a completely fresh start, endeavor to give a precise answer to the question. And we, we can assign that to every new problem and every new question. So we use everything in our background, uh, but essentially we're using our best thinking based on all the knowledge we have today and a new problem. It's a very profound comment. Uh, interesting, uh, von Hildebrand was one of the earliest uh, person, outspoken persons against Nazism, and it goes all the way back to 1923, 10 years before Hitler came to power. He realized the harm it could cause, and he worked hard to stop it, obviously was not successful, uh, but he did spread the word far and wide. In the end, uh, he ended up at Fordham University. Von Hildebrand was very lucky to get out of uh, Vienna in 1938. That's a separate story, very heroic story. Um, thankfully, he was he survived uh, and, along with his works. Um, the Deferment Truth is a is a book. Uh, it's an essay within a book. Uh, it was first written in 1943 and then published in a number of different areas. Um, one of the main themes is this idea of isms. So we hear a lot about isms today. I might ask John Henry to make a quick comment. W what, what do these isms mean? Yeah, well, I mean, the isms that he talks about here, which we'll talk about shortly, are things like relativism or historicism, but they all um, by virtue of being an ism, he has in mind that they are kind of ideology. And as an ideology, they're not ideology, not in the sense of something that you're not, not like my theory of the world or, or the ideas that I'm convinced about, but I, but ideas that we tend to absorb sometimes unconsciously. And so uh, he wants to say that in an ideological setting, uh, uh, you could even say something true by accident, but if you don't understand it, if you don't grasp it, um, it, it runs the risk of becoming a kind of ideology. And so that's that's what this book is all about, are the dangers of these different kinds of, of ideologies. And that's why he says, as it says here in the in the notes here, that it that every ideology ultimately has a disregard for truth, because it's not necessarily interested in what's true. It might be interested in other reasons. For example, it, they may someone may claim true things, but really in an effort to seize power. And so that's, 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 that's a what, very important and one of the most important things we get out of this pro, uh, reading. Think about this, every individual, you cannot have a relationship with anyone. You can't run a business. You can't operate within a community if you don't have truth, uh, because what you end up with is total chaos. So truth is absolutely important to humanity. And one thing to think about, just because you don't know the truth, you discover it at a later date 
doesn't mean it wasn't true all along. So we're constantly trying to discover the truth. Now we could we could ask our government, did you tell us the truth about COVID? You can make up your own mind. <laughs> um, he says, Hildebrand says, uh, the truth of this ultimate judge and the undisputed disposition of any discussion. Think of a court of law, American court of law. What's the one thing they're trying to do? They're trying to get to the truth of what happened. Are you guilty or are you innocent? Um, a statement is often true as conformity to reality, so objective truth for everybody. So truth is absolute, undisputable, similar to a law of physics, law of mathematics, uh, in, in our industry, law of fans. It's absolute, can't be disputed. Uh, we actually have had people in the past try to dispute the laws of fans. They don't change. When ideologies, isms replace objective truth, uh, we have subjective measures. We know what happens. So think about this. When the Fed said inflation was transitory, were they telling the truth? Well, about eight months later, they said, let's not use the word transitory anymore. Um, you can make up your own, own mind, but the fact that it was labeled transitory caused substantial pain within our country. And that pain continues. So the role of truth is predominant, decisive, and absolutely necessary. And when you don't have truth, what do you have? The decomposition of man's very life. Uh, disrespect for the truth uh, destroys all morality, all reasonableness, all rationality, all community life. Um, we're stressing this, but, and, it, and as you think through these things, if someone lies to you, it completely undermines that relationship because now you can no longer trust them. Uh, so the truth and honesty is imperative to every relationship, every business, everything we do. Uh, peace among individuals or nations is all based on trust. And once broken, it can't be replaced. Uh, there exists an intimate link between the dethronement of truth and terrorism, uh, brutal force, uh, replaces right, fear, supplants, trust. We see evidence in this in the marketplace all the time. If you think back to World War II, we were one of the few countries in the entire world that wasn't run by despots and evil people. There were very few exceptions. Thankfully, the good guys won the war. Uh, but if they hadn't, we would be living miserable lives. So the the theorem of truth has uh, basically four isms, relativism, pragmatism, progressivism, historicism, and psychologicalism. I might ask John Henry to make just a quick comment on those. Why those four? Well, you know, Hildebrand in, in the book uh, wants to explore the, the different causes of the dethronement of truth, which is a which is a broader phenomenon where truth is is considered is, is ignored or forgotten. Um, and he thinks that these four isms are explanatory in significant ways, but there would be other ones as well. It just happens to be these were the central ones that he that he focuses on. And uh, maybe I'll save some more comments as we go through them individually, because I know that's that's coming up. But he does note that uh, that the he has an interesting idea that in earlier times uh, you would have people in the academy who would. Uh, make the case for relativism or skepticism. Um, but he says that sort of ordinary experience kept people somewhat insulated from these ideas, right? We still knew from our ordinary experience that uh, that truth is the measure, uh, that uh, that we need to settle our disputes with reference to what the truth is, that we need to find out what is true. But he has this idea that over time, those ideas that began among intellectuals uh, boil down into the culture, they begin to spread, and then they and then they begin, then what begins as a theoretical set of problems become, it begins to reshape people's experience. And he notes here that, uh, he, by the way, I don't think he was, you know, specifically opposed to the idea of universal education, but he does note that the much greater access to, 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 to education in the culture meant that many of these isms were spread at a much more rapid pace to young people, from professors with the authority in the eyes of the young person, um, and of course, the you know this is not a, maybe an original observation, but he mentions already in 19, in 1943 that 
uh, that the problem of what he calls the perpetual massage of our minds by essentially mass media plays a significant role in this as well. So, so that, that, that speaks to the, the way in which these isms were spread and the acceleration of the spread happened. But we can now look at the, uh, at the individual slides to look at these individual isms more closely. Yeah, and that applies today. So think about if you go to a movie and they tell you a story and they make certain implications, usually if I do that, I immediately do some research to say, does this make any sense at all? Is this actually what happened? And very often it's not. If you read any newspaper, um, any magazine, listen to any radio show, TV, they had, they, now they call it spin. They used to call it lying. Uh, so they, they present the story in a way that um, what they want you to believe. And a lot of it's related to these four um, isms. They're, they're promoting certain themes and they're doing it with spin. So think of spin as just outright lying. That's what it is. Uh, so we, we can uh, go to these sources and, and many people find this today. What source do I go to that I can absolutely count on? It's pretty difficult. So again, we, we get back to the same theme. It's imperative to have the truth. And you all remember George Orwell, uh, 1984. Well, it probably turned out a little worse than he predicted. And we're living in that generation today. Okay, relativism is the idea that truth is not absolute. Uh, we can all look at it differently. This is back into spin. This is how I saw the story. That's okay if you say I'm, when you're not uh, required to present the facts, you can say, this is how I look at the world. That's an opinion. But if you're reporting a story, it's got to be based on the truth. Uh, you know, it's often said that the first reports on anything that happens in the world are usually very mixed up and very wrong. And then eventually they get sorted out. But for a casual listener, maybe we never actually know the truth of a particular thing that happened. So a proposition is either true or it's false. It, it can never be true to, you, to one person and not true to another person. So the truth is absolute. It's a law of physics. It's a law of humanity. It's natural law. If we can accept the fact that truth is absolute, then what we want to do is discover the truth. Because we, if we live in truth, life is more simple. Uh, we know what to expect. Uh, if, if we don't live in the truth, expectations are not going to be met. Now, if you took any six-year-old and you showed them this slide, they would say to mom or dad, hey, that's something wrong here. Two and two is four. Uh, but in the adult world, we can say, well, to me, two and two is five. It's pretty silly, actually, if you think about it, to state anything that's not absolutely truthful. Now, sometimes we're just going to be wrong about the truth. And that's why we use the terminology that we're always seeking the truth which is why if I go to a movie, I want to do a lot of research to say, let me have a better understanding of what ac actually happened here. Bob, can I, can I make one comment on that? Before yeah, we... go ahead, John Henry. So just, just to, I, I think you're alluding to this here. You know, sometimes you know, people think that, well, if, if truth means the correspondence to reality, that truth is just really simple and obvious. Well, that's not the case. I mean, that's why we, we get an education. That's why we learn how to explore the world and to, and to, and to amass evidence for the the questions that we're posing. So uh, it's a sort of a straw man that you sometimes get uh, that if you're not a relativist, you're sort of implying that the knowledge of the truth is easy. Some truths present themselves with, with clarity, like as you mentioned to the child there, but others take work. And I think I think Von Hildebrand isn't in any way disputing that. He knows that. Yeah, you know, this idea that progressives started back in the early part of the 20th century and it sounds really good. I'm a progressive. So on the surface, you'd say, hey, terrific. I'm progressive too. <laughs> uh, but if you think about the progressive ideas that go all the way back, like the income tax, how many of you think it, taking money out of your paycheck is a good idea? Uh, I don't think I'd see many hands if, if I could see those hands today. Uh, pragmatism also sounds good. I'm just very pragmatic. And think about in the in the COVID days. So 
um, members of Congress voted for over $5 trillion of money that the government doesn't have that goes on as permanent debt. And it, and I've actually asked Congressman, why did you vote for those bills? And they said, well, it's just something we had to do to please the people. <laughs> okay. But now if we look back on it, we have raging inflation. The government has serious debt, which has other implications. Uh, we could go into why did uh, the Silicon Bank uh, go out of business? Because if they marked their government securities to market and people got a sense of this, they had no equity. Uh, so the government says all corporations have to mark to market every time they report. And this just means they have to say, what's the fair market value of our assets? But they list in an exception for the banks. If you say we're going to hold on to our government securities, you don't have to report the truth to the people as they understand it. So if there's an edict, this government says everything's marked to market. We assume everything's marked to market, but we just found out that banks don't report marked to market. If you want to read Wall Street Journal today, they have an editorial on that subject. So we rely on the truth. When we're not told the truth, the implications are bad. So how many banks have gone out of business over this issue? And for the record, there is close to multi-trillion dollars in losses within our banking and Federal Reserve system that are currently not being reported. So the current news, everything's kind of okay. Well, Silicon Bank, they made a couple of errors and we, we just took care of all that. But the reality, there's deep-seated problems with the financial system that nobody's going to tell you about and unless you look very hard for them. So maybe one of the takes homes today is don't take anything at face value. Do your own research. Seek and find the truth. That's what he's trying to tell us. Uh, John Henry, can you comment on this uh, historicism? Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, th this is a great uh, theme in Hildebrand more generally. It's this th this idea that um, that tr that the criterion for truth is in correspondence to reality, but sort of what corresponds to the mentality of a certain place and time, right? So the example here, the regime of the Chinese Communist Party is incompatible with the American way of life. That might actually be true, but that doesn't even begin to get at the at the issue of what might be wrong with communism. And I thought that um, I might read, there's a wonderful passage in, in the book, a couple of lines where Hildebrand quotes C.S. Lewis on what Lewis calls the historical point of view. Um, and I think it's a, it, it's a, this is a this is a particularly important idea, I think, because there's a certain vulnerability to it in the academic world. Even people who are committed to quality education might fall a bit prey to this. So let me read just a few lines here. Hildebrand quoting C.S. Lewis, where he says, this is Lewis, who says, the historical point of view means that when a learned man is presented with any statement in an ancient author, so he's talking about classical texts, the one question he never asks is whether it is true. He asks who influenced the ancient writer and how far the statement is consistent with what he said in other books and what phase in the writer's development uh, or in the general history of thought, how it affected later writers and what the general course of criticism has been, what the present state of the question is. Uh, to regard the ancient writer, and this is important, as a possible source of knowledge, to anticipate that what he said could possibly modify your thoughts or your behavior, this would be regarded as unutterably simple-minded. So the idea is that you demonstrate your, your learnedness as a student or a scholar by knowing all about the text, the history of the text, the history of the author, but you never really take seriously what the author is trying to propose to you uh, and ask whether what is being said might be true. That's historicism. Very interesting. Uh, as we all know, it's very hard to get absolute truth about history because that's written by authors hundreds of years later, and some of them have a point of view they're trying to bring across. So we, we've all struggled with that over a period of time. By the way, Hildebrand, so, you had it there on the previous slide. He says the problem with historicism is that it obscures valuable truths. What he means to say is that there are, first of all, there are truths that, that these authors might have to offer to us. And he also wants to say that it's actually good to learn about you know, the the influence of certain authors. How did Plato, you know, in, influence those who came after him? What is the in, what is the influence of of ancient Roman thought on 
on the American founding, for example. The problem is when that replaces any question of truth, when it becomes this kind of total preoccupation of just always exploring the history. That's what he wants to say is the problem. Yeah, so this idea of the underlying motivations of a speaker are decisive for the truth of his or her statements. So you can have an opinion as a woman, as a man, as a conservative, as a liberal, but, but does that have any remote thing to do with the truth? What would you say, John Henry? Well, I think Hildebrand wants to say that, uh, that the psychological motives or the point of view is important, and you might want to take it into account. But once again, when it becomes kind of the, like if someone says, and you get this, you know, among, I think you get this in literature, for example, or, uh, you know, where you've got a, a fascinating personality and all of the criticism right. about the text is about, you know, the person's life, what was the relationship to their parents, um, how did this, you know, how did this traumatic experience affect them? And so, again, it's a kind of sidestepping of questions of truth. And Hildebrand says that, he, he says it does a kind of deep disservice to someone, you know, to, you know, to have them express what they want to say. And then rather than, than, than weighing what they're saying and trying to understand what they're saying to instead sort of try to find the, why are they saying this? What are the motives for it? And he makes the very good point that there are really, there are certain cases where asking about the motives would be perfectly justified. For example, if someone I knew well, like you, Bob, you know, one day started to say things that were totally out of character for you, well, then I might go wondering what's up, you know, has something happened, you know, as, is he undergoing some kind of terrible strain? But it's in those circumstances that the motives matter, but not necessarily when you're reading, you know, what a what a what a what a what an important author is offering or arguing for, particularly when they're offering reasons for what they have to say. So again, this is a very common problem. I think one way in which this mm -hmm. comes out today too is that people will people become very possessive about who gets to say what. Well, you're not a woman, so you shouldn't have any perspective on a woman's perspective. And, and this goes down, down the line. And of course, we should be respectful of those perspectives. But, you know, to, to take it to an extreme, I mean, we could never really know any other point of view other than our own, which is hardly uh, a knowledge of truth. Yeah, one of the things I've learned in recent years uh, with my friend Adrian Bijan is the idea of conforming to reality and physics conforms to reality and it's instructive to us that if we try to make our statements and learn in conformance to reality life becomes a lot simpler we're just dealing with reality all the time and if you deal with reality and truth then you can work on solving the problems that you have to face if there's untruth raveled in there you can't really solve the problem because you haven't fully identified the problem yeah you know, Bob, one thing, too, about all of these isms that makes them different from a lie, like in the case of a lie, someone might know that they're lying, unless they're a pathological liar, and there's an attempt to deceive. But what makes these isms so insidious is that, you know, the historicist or the relativist, they don't necessarily think that they're lying. They they actually think this is a an accurate account of the world. But the problem is that they they, they basically live in a world in which truth is never the criterion. It's always expediency, what works. Um, or in the case of historicism, it's just a complete ignoring. That's why Hildebrand says that indifference to truth is in a way the worst symptom of the dethronement of truth. Because at that point, it's like it's like people have gone from caring about truth and maybe trying to hide or come up with you know, excuses to simply not caring anymore and replacing truth with other lesser standards. Yeah, I might do a follow-up on that. Vaclav Klaus was the second uh, elected president of the Czech Republic. And I attended a speech that he gave in the United States. And one of the things he said was exactly that. He said, I believe in the environment, but I don't believe in environmentalism. And I don't believe in any isms for that matter. It was a very clear statement of what he believed in, what he thought was true, and what he thought was a, a perversion of truth. So what are some of the takeaways? Indifference towards the question of truth of a thing, uh, the worst symptoms of perversion of the human mind. So our mind is geared for the truth. We learned it from Aristotle, from Thomas Aquinas. It's absolutely true. Seeking the truth means making reality the standard of which we judge our concepts. Pretty simple, right? The hard part is getting to the truth. Uh, and that takes a lot of discovery. Human dignity and freedom are connected to us us, us being the kind of beings who we can seek and come to know the truth about reality. So 
a big part of our life is discovery of truth. And if we discover truth, we can be problem solvers. We can understand how the world's working. If, if, if we're told that inflation is not really a problem, it's going to go away in a few months, and we actually believe that, we end up in a really bad place, which we're at right now. And the corrective action is going to take a very long time. And the damage done from not taking correction action based on non-truth uh, will probably be with us for our lifetime. Um, von Hildebrand was a fierce anti-Nazi. Uh, he, he uh, with the help of the uh, prime minister in Austria, wrote a a newspaper uh, about the dangers of Nazism, and Hitler had personally uh, dictated a letter that when they come to Austria, he's the number one first guy to be arrested. So he was a very, very courageous man. Uh, the thesis, all ideologies, despite being different, are very similar to one another in their fundamental opposition to the truth. Very, very powerful statement. Only the one truth opposes all errors. One error can never be overcome by another. <laughs> we see a lot of evidence that in the world. Uh, the, the Nazis claimed that the real enemy was communism. The fact of the matter, the real enemy is Nazism, communism, and fascism, plain and simple. Um, and while they're different, there's not a large distinction uh, among the three. Uh, John Henry, we're getting toward the end. Uh, do you want to make a few comments? Yeah, yeah. I just uh, just to go back to that. So the this thing, this piece here called "False Fronts" was one of the essays that Hildebrand published in his anti-Nazi journal. And as you mentioned, the uh, he had help originally from the Austrian Chancellor, who interestingly enough was then murdered by Nazis in a in a coup. And later, Hildebrand did not have as much support from the the next Chancellor, and it became a much more unstable operation, but he continued to the very end. And uh, there was a speech given at the time by, I think it was by Goebbels, but it was one of the, the high-ranking Nazis at one of the, uh, the, 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 the big gatherings in Nuremberg, where um, he said that the, the world is, can be divided between national socialists and Bolsheviks, which, which meant, of course, communists. And, and there was a, at, at the time, you would have found great political animosity between people on the left who would have been communist in leaning, socialist in leaning, and people on the far right who would have been the fascist and the, and, and the Nazis. And so it was, it was sort of understandable how people thought that that was the dividing line um, sort of in the power structure of the world at the time. But Hildebrand says, no, 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 despite all of the, the appearances of hostility between these two, the reality is that the two of them are, I don't think he used this phrase, but something like evil twins or evil cousins. They share uh, the found, they, they have certain foundational things in common. So the collectivism, for example, the disregard for the individual person, uh, the kind of state-sponsored relativism, you know, truth doesn't matter anymore, the interest, the spirit of the German people matters. So this whole essay is about showing how the real uh, antithesis to Nazism and communism is the Western intellectual and moral tradition. And he goes on to say that even those who would not no longer say, consider themselves Christian believers, for example, he says they still live by the light of an inheritance of that tradition. So for example, one of the great uh, ideas in the Western tradition is this idea of imago Dei, that we <clears throat> are made in the image of God. And you, know, you can take that in a more theological way, but what it means is that we have these distinguishing features like freedom of the will or capacity to know truth or inalienable rights. We're not just bundles of matter. Um, and, and Hildebrand wants to say, in that respect, even people who may not consider themselves to be practicing Christians, they're really on the side of the West, uh, whatever whatever else they may, whatever other crit criticisms they might feel towards the Western tradition, they hold to these core principles. So it's a, it's a very interesting essay because many of his essays were written to his fellow Catholics to try to motivate them to be more active in fighting Hitler. This is an essay that in a way tries to address everyone, everyone who is opposed to the Nazis, to national socialism, can make common cause with these these core Western ideas. So this slide here highlights the three of the three of the four that he mentions in the essay. There's the profound reverence for truth. That's why uh, we're talking about it today. The clear consciousness that the question of truth stands at the beginning of all decisions. And he goes, you know, he says in various places in this book that 
Sure, there have been plenty of times where, you know, uh, the local dictator would do things in the name of truth and, of course, have no intentions to follow it. But there was still a, a universal understanding that the standard was truth. So he's quite clear about the fact that, you know, I mean, or religious wars, you know, maybe they weren't always about religion, maybe they were about power, but there was still a universal understanding that this is the standard. The second point he makes here is conviction that there is an objective moral law, independent of all subjective interests, arbitrariness, and mere power. Again, even if you uh, you wanted to um, to exploit vulnerable people, if you were a king or a you know whatever, um, you still you couldn't openly deny the existence of a moral law. And then I mentioned, of course, the imago dei, this idea that that it's, it's an elevated notion of what it means to be a human person. So. It's 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 a wonderful, it's a very powerful essay because again, he he somehow shows how the West has these great resources that made it the real enemy of of the Nazis and of the communists. And, and you can witness uh, adverse impacts. A federal judge goes to Stanford Law School and is not allowed to speak. He's being shouted down, so they, they don't want to hear the truth as he sees it. So they just shout them down. People are getting fired for saying what is absolutely true, but it doesn't comport with current ideology, current beliefs. Uh, we're, we're witnesses throughout our society. And what ends up happening, the mob tries to shut down truth. And when truth is shut down, we end up in a very bad place. Nazi Germany, China, Cuba, Russia. Uh, and maybe almost to close with this idea that um, why are people fighting so hard to get in the United States? So internally, everybody says, we have all these warps and warts and we've done all these things wrong, but people are risking their lives to get in this country because it's more free than most countries. Uh, we can see the stepping stone. When you deny truth, you're going to a very bad place and the outcomes are going to be very bad. And we've witnessed this for 2,500 years of recorded history. So key takeaways, if you want to meet the challenge of isms of our time, we must return to the primacy of truth. If we do, we can oppose ideologies of our time, recovering the dignity and the freedom of the human person. So human dignity covers the whole span of the way we deal with each other. We, we don't have to like each other, we don't have to like somebody's ideas, but we treat them with respect. So, and, and this idea of truth goes into engineering. It goes into the way Captivere does business. It, it, it goes into our schools. Are we truthful to the students so that they can live a productive life? Um, so the truth is so powerful. It's so overwhelming. I hope this will cause you to think more about it and you will you will have a better life so thank you very much for your time and attention if you have questions uh, send them to us and we will answer them separately so we're going to close thanks for being with us today have a good evening